So what I've been asked to do is sort of set the scene very quickly about ITS, uh, how we perhaps got to where we are today, and there are lessons learned along the way. And I would say that the state of Texas was involved from the very beginning of the ITS movement and played a, played a terrific role, I think, a leadership role, both at A&M with Bill Harris, as some of you may, may remember, and uh, others. So it's natural for Texas to continue to be greatly involved and in a leadership, leadership role. Well, what is, what is ITS? I'm going to not, all of you know what it is, so I'm not going to go through a lot of background, but why did it get started? Well, there were things taking place in the U.S. in the middle of the last century, quite frankly, and led to thinking about how we could harness, leverage emerging technologies more for the transportation purpose, and we were, we were challenged by the number of fatalities and the cost of the highway system in terms of crashes and you can think of all the industries associated with it. So consequently, the notion was, let's think about what we need to put in place that can make the highway system a lot safer. So these are just some metrics that were used. Um, and of course, at the time in which we started this, we were killing about 50,000 people on our highways. So I can't say that ITS has caused a lot of this change, but certainly more collaboration and cooperation between, <clears throat> excuse me, the OEMs and the state DOTs and the city transportation agencies has been a great deal. There were other issues naturally associated with that, but out of that period of time, what was developed was an overall vision of creating an environment where vehicles would not crash, be totally independent uh, in terms of crash release. So, and about, uh, and I know in the mid uh, um, 20th century, we were driving vehicles that you could not crash. And consequently, that now has extrapolated into a lot of technologies that you see on board the vehicles today. But it was pushing those technologies. We didn't have the market pull that we, we have now. So everyone has technology-enabled safety in their vehicles today, and we've made a great stride in that direction. So consequently, that's why we have fewer fatalities to a large extent. But it's not just the vehicles. A lot has happened to the highway environment as well. So there are a lot of other benefits associated with the technology. But then it created new challenges and new issues that we're having to deal with. And certainly, thanks to the former secretary and initiative of the, of the DOT, we made a lot of progress in, in distracted driving, and, and we know here locally uh, how that's beginning to take effect. So what's happening? We, we talk a lot about connected vehicle, a lot about autonomous vehicles, but what's the pathway to these crashless vehicles? The stage that we're in now, quite frankly, is the connected vehicle stage. You can say, as many of us have, that autonomous vehicles are on the horizon. T essentially, they're here. But how long does that take, and what's the pathway? The connected vehicle is considered to be the first, first stage in that pathway. And so consequently, there are demonstrations taking place now on wireless connection and exchange of information, and we're going to talk about a little bit more about that throughout this conference. And then to autonomous, the uh, partial or or full self-driving, everything coordinated and cooperative. So we're on a path full of events like distracted driving that we know that we have to deal with. Now back at the, when the ITS started, this was what the vision was. This was a typical image that you saw about the future. But this was in the 50s and perhaps uh, on through up the 60s. And now we're, we're beginning to believe, and you can see those cars in the background with their, with their fins, you know, that gives you some idea of what, what era we're talking about. So this was a commonly held vision and direction. So how did, this, how did the movement start? Well, there was a group that got together called Mobility 2000, but this was in 86. 
So for the movement to get started, it was in the, again, mid-80s. We were thinking about technology and how we could leverage that technology. <clears throat> IVHS stood for Intelligent Vehicle Highway System. <clears throat> excuse me. That's because during the Reagan administration, <coughs> excuse me, it was felt that we needed to harness uh, uh, advancing technology, and the Federal Highway Administration was the lead in that group. <clears throat> so there was a st development of a strategic plan, a, a roadmap, and all of that went forward so that in, in the early 1990s, ITS was funded. And there was a notion about R&D, and R and R&T and R in this case. <clears throat> so in essence, there were milestones and plans, and I can tell you that this group was meeting independently. Uh, the federal government was involved, state DOTs were involved, but in essence, very little funding. Very little research was put into the program. So there were major milestones developed. <clears throat> Excuse me, thank you, great. You don't have a little bourbon, do you? Put in this. <laughs> <coughs> so mainstream means that you take the existing program elements that the DOTs receive, and you have flexibility in how you use those funds. So in essence, they could put it into a variety of, of activities. That was very difficult to do. You can imagine that the state DOTs were not excited about having the funds diverted or enabling an opening up of their dedicated funds to fund the traditional programs that had a high priority as well. So you can see the tension that was created, at least in the government's uh, cycle around the country. And there were other events that created opportunities for, the, for ITS. But what really happened during that period of time was the realization that technology could make a difference and that we're talking about data, information, and communication. But there were a lot of things that we did not have at that time. <clears throat> One of the first programs uh, that I was involved in in ITS was putting transponders on trucks to allow them to be identified as they're rolling down the road. Now, we take transponders today for granted. There were no transponders for vehicles back in that era. So a lot of the R&D was done on creating uh, antennas embedded in the pavement, which is a terrible thing to do, and then being able to have, have a device that could be read and help identify the trucks as they're moving down the road. That was an R&D effort that turned into a not-for-profit corporation today. <clears throat> so it's still operating, but it's taken 25 years to move what was considered to be low-hanging fruit into effective use on, on the highway system. But that's an example of technology. And now we have transponders, um, a large number of technologies available. Many of those, though, cannot communicate with one another. So the issue now, like, it's like the technologies of the past, is there going to be a standard that will be adapted by all the toll road authorities so that you can read them nationwide? Oh, and oh, by the way, international groups have their own standards. So Again, we have that issue of not only being able to uh, become interoperable, which means to be read at a different location, but then you have coding issues associated with the technology. So just, be, just because you can get a reading of the technology from the truck on the transponder doesn't mean that you can read the data and information that you receive. Anyway, technology creates new challenges and new opportunities, and that's where we are today to a large extent. But we've made a lot of headway. So the pathway to development suggests <clears throat> that, indeed, there are safety pilots underway now, uh, V to V, V to I, uh, vehicle to, to vehicle, and vehicle to infrastructure, then early deployments. Traditionally, the way we've introduced technology is through pilots and demonstration programs. And in essence, we have demonstration programs underway today like, the v, like we were talking about uh, connected vehicles in Ann Arbor and other locations, there is a, a procurement out now from the federal government to talk about connected vehicle opportunities, and I guess there will be more initiatives underway. But pilots and demonstrations are the way in which you begin to introduce technology or changes into the stream. So there's a 
terrific opportunity. This is just some examples of, of the, how we think the technology will begin to emerge. Now, we talk about convoys. So back in 1997, we had a demonstration on I-15 outside of San Diego where we platooned vehicles operating what was the HOV lanes at that particular time. And that was in 97. Now today, there are a number of demonstrations taking place around, around the globe. So we have this technology. It's been in operation. But if you'd looked in the trunk of those GM cars that were being platooned in San Diego, you'd have seen that it was full of equipment. It was incredible to see the, what was taking place. The other part of it was, <clears throat> as I've mentioned a few times be before, we had uh, the head of the science, the House Committee on Science, in the back seat of one of the vehicles in the platoon. So you're traveling at 60 plus miles per hour at about three foot headways along us. Scared the hell out of he, We, uh, in fact, we learned very quickly from that. And we had a driver, we had an operator, and he was there uh, to make sure that no one tried to touch anything or if anything happened along the way. But uh, poor uh, Chairman, uh, Wilson was absolutely petrified because of the, the scariness. So we learned a lot from that platooning exercise. But you can see what the others are doing here from Volvo traveling at about 53 miles per hour, Japan at 50 miles per hour with the spacings that they have. They learned too that you need to give a little bit of spacing between vehicles. So we have that capability. So how do we go about introducing it? And oh, by the way, of course, the Google car changed a lot of expectations and a vision for a lot of us. Every manufacturer today has the capability of an autonomous vehicle, as far as I know. They all claim they do, but I can't verify that they in fact do. So there's an expectation that the really transformational technology is the autonomous vehicle. And that's all built on a framework of communication and safety and probably not as uh, many operational changes to the infrastructure that, that would be needed under the current technology, but there will be operational changes. So where are we? We see that there will be a pathway forward. Some think that the time frame is very quick, and others don't. The L3, L4 refer to NHTSA's National Highway Traffic Safety Administration guidelines are on levels of automation. Um, there are five levels, four being the highest level, zero being what we have today. But you can see the pathway, you see the timelines. For every one of a chart like this, we can have a dozen more or so that can give you different examples of one timeline. But the fact is, we believe it's going to happen, and we believe that it's coming. And it's built on communication, wireless communication is built on information, and that's what we're here talking about. So other pathways, autonomous unmanned military vehicles, yes, we have those, we had that capability for quite a while. And so consequently, what we're hoping to do is move along this curve toward an automated highway system at some point in the future. So there's other safety roadmap and Remember that the premise started with safety. How do we reduce the fatalities that we're experiencing and all the other impacts associated with crashes on the system? And we believe that in long range that there's a vision where there are no fatalities. And of course, that's, that's a hard, hard vision to, to take, but many countries have had that for a long time. Zero fatalities. That's the goal and objective, and there are pathways through automated uh, systems, highway system that take us there. What's another component in this whole network that we're talking about? We'll be talking a great deal about this throughout this conference. <clears throat> there was an issue between the, the manufacturers, the OEMs, and the state DOTs, and quite frankly, uh, cities as well. 
The automobile manufacturers believe that they own the data and the information. The vehicle becomes the sensor. How many sensors are there on a typical automobile today? Probably two to 400, or maybe even more. So consequently, the manufacturers got together about uh, 2,000 or so and said, look, we have the sensor. The automobile will be the sensor. It'll be the platform for collecting the data and, the, and conveying the information. And the infrastructure owners said, well, wait a minute. You're using our network which to collect the information and the data, so it's our system. It's our, our information, our data. So to resolve this conflict, and I just happened to be chair of ITS America when that, when that came forward, I said, OK, let's convene through, the, through, F, through uh, USDOT, through the secretary's office. So we met with the secretary and asked them to be the convener of pulling the manufacturers together and the OEMs together and see if we can work out this challenge. As you can see, that's a real problem. Because everyone believed that I know in that business believes that the data and the information that come from this system has value, monetary value. No one's been able to quite figure out what the business model is yet, still underway. But if the data and the information have value and it's worth something, then consequently, whoever owns the data sets the rules. And you know the golden rule. So consequently, um, there was a lot of focus on the sensors. The state DOTs, the infrastructure owners, were faced with having to make huge investments if they went forward with a model that required that the, the, everything be installed in the, in the infrastructure. It's not necessary. Uh, so there's a compromise on that. But obviously, there's a, there's a game going on. So in, guess, in, in this case, um, digital map capability, GPS, develop uh, greater refinement still going on now. Uh, some of the capabilities that we hear about the wireless technology, and you may have heard on, on NPR this morning that the FCC last week uh, opened up the opportunity for a greater use of wireless spectrum. So this is basically what we're faced with, 5.9 gigahertz. For the dedicated short-range communication is what uh, the standard that we're operating here in the U.S. So a lot of the transponders use that technology, but they're also using 802.11 uh, wireless technologies on megahertz. So anyway, this gives you some idea of what the capability might be. We're going, as I said, I'm supposed to tee this up for the groups that are following later today. The wireless technology revolution is that the private sector. Uh, has been active and engaged. As I say, we will hear about that. Today, the navigation systems uh, that we are used to are in about 70% of all the cars that are produced. So consequently, all of a sudden, we had technology that was being pushed into the marketplace. Now there's a pull, not just for, for the navigation capability, but other technologies as well, as well that enhance safety. So in essence, uh, the, it, there's a major change that's taking place. There's no clear winner as to what technologies will end up occupying the space, but we've made a tremendous progress in the last couple of decades. But the spectrum is a big issue, and that's another whole fight that needs to take place, and it's underway, underway now. <coughs> 5 9 gigahertz was allocated by the FCC to safety. So our right to have access and use that space is based on, on the safety considerations initially. So but we have to protect it. If we don't use it, we lose it. There are others out there that we'd like to have. So what are some other topics? The big one that we'll be discussing here, of course, in part, is the data ownership. Who owns the data? Who sets up the rules? There are privacy issues. Uh, it will require some infrastructure investments, um, as we talk about the, the, um, the uh, connected vehicles. There is the data management. Should, who should manage this data? Who should operate it? Should it be in the public domain, or should there be private sector opportunities? The large system integrators exist in the U.S. 
and there are those operating in that space, and many of you are familiar with the large corporations that do that. They are interested in moving into that if they can figure out what the business model happens to be. Right now, they'd like to move in that under contract to the state DOTs, for example, who have traffic management centers and have data to operate there. So there are issues associated with data management, distribution, pricing. Everybody wants data. Everybody, we have this enormous capability now of generating extraordinary databases, data files. That ITS technology, all of which we've been talking about, has the capability of overwhelming us. There are rules now that govern some of the traffic data that is collected. Will that change? <clears throat> so we have this enormous capability of collecting data, and then how do we manage it? You, this is just to represent that, that the ways in which we've been managing data have changed dramatically, and there are changes that will continue to take place. And it's not an easy decision to deal with. There are uh, the possibilities of overwhelming the space with data. So <clears throat> when you put it all together and start looking at the problem, which DSTOP will be looking at, you know, you've got some interesting challenges in front of you, but it's exciting. I mean, it's one of the huge excitements, I think, in our industry. And what it's also doing is bringing a multidisciplinary approach to this issue and this problem. And DSTOP uh, exemplifies that. So data, we understand that. Out of the data, we hope that we have information, and of course, ultimately, we think that it'll lead to, to wisdom. That's the challenge. <clears throat> Enormous research opportunities once we have the data in place. So the ownership issue of the data is going to be one of, it's still being, being fought out, as a matter of fact. And I think it's going to get richer in the discussion and require public-private partnerships, of course, which many of them do already. So when you do that, of course, then there are other issues that come up, right? So consequently, now we're thinking about security of the data and, and keep the uh, people from accessing it that aren't supposed to. So there are rules to be made and a lot of interesting challenges. So adoption, the reliability of the technology, the liability and the affordability. I mean, if you just stop and think, which all of you have done, about all the changes that technology is bringing about and all the challenges that it's creating. It's a wonderful field for research and for students to get into because the access is going to be a huge issue. So there are institutional issues. The government's waiting to see what they need to do. And of course, Google, for example, wants government to stay out of it. No rules, let it, let it unfold but government has a responsibility. And the, certainly the barriers, I believe the barriers will be over, overcome. The loss of privacy and so forth, you know, we really don't have any privacy now to a large extent. It's the degree of identification and access that's the issue. So what are the emerging priorities today where we stand? One, zero deaths and zero injuries. Do we have the capability to do that on our highway system. And of course, I just, we're just talking about, I'm just talking about highways, <clears throat> but it fits in all the other industries as well. And ITS, of course, is across all, all modes of transportation. Reliable travel. <clears throat> we used to talk about congestion, we still do. It's really reliability is what we're talking about. We were forced to face that as a, an approach to the congestion problem to a large extent. Connected vehicles, the next step toward autonomous vehicles or driverless vehicles. We still have security both in the cyber space as well as in other spaces and sustainability and trip planning. So in essence, uh, wonderful opportunities brought by technology, interesting challenges, but we've made considerable progress, I think, since the 1950s and consequently, certainly since the turn of the century into the transportation. So ITS is rich opportunity. There's a lot of space 
for new business models to deal with this data and communication industry. So with that, I'll, I'll stop, John, turn it back over to you and John. Good morning. Hope everyone can hear me. Uh, let me begin by thanking Dr. Bod and uh, the DSTOP Center for allowing me an opportunity to come in and visit with you this morning and congratulations on this initiative. I think it will be a transformational opportunity across the globe and I would encourage all of you to be excited about your opportunity to be a part of it. This is an incredibly important and increasingly important topic for all of us and as Dr. Walton pointed out it will be transformational creating a sea change in transportation and how we manage our systems what we do to develop and deliver these services to the public and the terms that people are using are game changers and I, I agree with that completely so the Department of Transportation here in Texas is proud to be involved in this uh, we want to be a partner with the universities with the industry with the public and thoughtfully considering how to move forward with intelligent transportation systems and solutions. And I really appreciate Dr. Walton kind of teeing up this conversation for you today, the history of how ITS came to be and its evolution to date. And so I want to talk a little bit about why public sector departments of transportation and other public sector entities may be interested in this. And what I'd like to do is uh, share a video with you if we can hopefully get this to run. Uh, to remind us all that uh, sometimes those of us who grew up in this era of Star Trek and Back to the Future have seen the future and it's here with us today. So let's see if the, oop, it's not going to run. Well, it would have been really cool. It was a, a video from uh, a movie that many of you may have seen um, that uh, my wife's favorite person in all the world uh, was in and um, it, it's called uh, The Minority Report. And uh, it was the scene where the primary actor walks into a department store and there's a retinal scan and it starts telling him who uh, he is and what he might want to purchase and how long it's been since he's been there. And for those ladies in the audience, you know that my, my wife's favorite person in all the world, I, I wish it was me, but it's really Tom Cruise, it was the guy that was going through there. And what's interesting about that is uh, I was with my youngest daughter, who happens to be 23 years old, lives in Houston, Texas, the other day. And as we were driving down Westheimer Freeway, she had her smartphone with her. And as we would pass stores, it would send her a notice that the, the bag that she wanted was on sale or that top that she had been investigating, that blouse, was available. And um, it made me think that the future really is with us. And so. It's not something we should think about. It's uh, not something we should be re reacting to. It's something we should be planning for because those realities exist today. Uh, let me ask you, how many of you saw the movie Back to the Future? Thought about the futuristic opportunities that that presents? Do you re recall what date in the future Marty and uh, Professor moved forward to? A lot of people thought there was a Facebook thing going on a few weeks ago that it had already occurred. It's October 21st, 2015. So if you haven't got your hoverboard yet, you need to start working on that because <laughs> that is the reality. And, and if you think about the past and the future, uh, ITS and intelligent transportation, transportation systems and solutions are much like any other technology that we've seen. They're all subject to the evolutionary trajectory of Moore's Law. And so when you think about this photograph of this lady at a switchboard, in reality, in terms of history, that wasn't all that long ago. And today, if we were not connected at all times with our smartphones, we would be woefully uh, disappointed. In fact, I, I know how frustrating it is for many of us when we're outside of service areas and uh, are flying on planes, and now we have to have connections even on planes. Uh, but you know, to think about that, the reality is it hasn't been too long since we went from that to this type of system, which is now completely outdated. And in fact, if, unless you're in Washington, D.C., I'm not sure you can find one of these phone booths anymore. And so these are just a couple of examples of how quickly things change. And it's important for us to understand the significance of these changes and how disruptive they can be to the society that we live in. And as public sector entities, 
We need to understand how these evolutions are impacting the way we do business, we provide services to the public, and uh, to think about those in a way that helps us jump the curve, if you will, to stay ahead of these evolutionary changes as they occur. And for public sector entities, that's pretty alarming. This is happening in everything we do. The communications, you know, when people first started being able to mass produce printed materials, what a change that meant for the world. And today, we're able to get access to virtually all the information that is known to mankind at the touch of our fingers through smart devices like this tablet. We also have gone from a time and place where transportation was something we owned and others helped us service to something now that is, uh, quite frankly, you can fill up your vehicle without going into the fueling station, uh, sometimes without even the use of a credit card by using an embedded chip in your keychain. And uh, so these disruptions occur that not only change the way we do business and how we think about our lives, but have fairly significant societal impacts. And it's something that I think is important for all of us to think about. I'll touch on this one. Uh, in the early part of the 20th century, as Dr. Walton suggested, the legislature was in session. There was a lot of conversation around a, tr a tremendous congestion problem here in Austin. It was on Congress Avenue, which is the avenue that runs north and south uh, from the Capitol in both directions, and primarily south Congress towards the river. The congestion problem was because too many of these types of vehicles were being utilized and they didn't have enough places and spaces to put the manure. And so it evolved into this type of vehicle and all of a sudden men and women who were paid handsomely at those days and age to dispose of all that manure were suddenly out of a job. And society had to adjust to that. And so today we're moving into this type of place and space where there's electric vehicles and connected vehicles and intelligent vehicles. And we have to be sensitive to the fact that the systems have to evolve and that we have to be prepared to change with these changes as they occur. And so in the public sector space and place, it's a responsibility that we all have. Now, those pictures may look like they took place over a fairly extended period of time. And in all honesty, they probably did. But how many of you can remember going to one of these places to rent a video? And it would have been probably in the year 2005, 6, or 7 that this was about the only option available to you, unless you wanted to actually purchase that video. And it was typically on a tape, not on a cassette, or on a disc, rather. And today, most people would use something that looks like this. And Blockbuster is all but out of business. And honestly, most of you in this room and perhaps those that you work with in the academic world would prefer to do this. And all these changes are happening so rapidly that business is having a hard time keeping up. New businesses are created, old businesses become obsolete. And as public sector entities that move along at geologic time compared to the rest of the world, it's important for us to be engaged in these conversations. And so that's primarily why Departments of transportation have to be actively engaged. Public sector entities have to be thoughtful, mindful, and intentionally involved in these conversations in order to continue to provide the services that we do for the public and be relevant. Because when people become irrelevant, when organizations become irrelevant, when entities become irrelevant, they go away. And so that's part of what we are there for. So can you imagine what the future might look like. And here's just a few photographs of some. There's this highly connected system of roadways on the top left-hand side of the screen. Getting your pizza delivered without having to go out for it, whether it's by drone or by a completely autonomous vehicle, is probably not that far away. And uh, for those of you that have laughed at the drone situation, Amazon is very serious about that. That is not something they thought of as a marketing scheme. That is something they intentionally intend to invest in and to provide to us. The Taco Bell, uh, if you'll notice, is on a fully integrated solar paneled parking lot that can change its striping configuration at a moment's notice, can provide for additional capacity for those that maybe are driving um, in a vehicle that's marked for disabled capacities. Uh, as many of us have seen that viral video about solar paneled roadways, it can make sure that there's no ice on the pavement and um, it's just a opportunity for technology and material sciences 
to overlap and interject themselves into a system. And then on the bottom right hand side of the screen is this uh, virtual technology that will allow us to be connected to everything we want and need as we travel up and down roadways uh, across the globe. So as the Department of Transportation across the, uh, the nation and we at the Texas Department of Transportation think about what these futures might be, what we would imagine them to be, a lot of the reasons we're invested in this are the things that Dr. Walton has already talked about. Travel times are increasing all across the globe. Here in Texas, people are facing longer and longer commutes. And for those of you that live and work in the Austin area, I'm sure you can attest to that. Research has shown that here in Texas, five of our communities are in the top 56 worst congested uh, communities in the nation. And for a state as big and vast as Texas, that's an alarming statistic. In fact, peak hour delays for average motorist in Texas has gotten to the point where it's almost 50 hours per year. That's over a, a full work week of delay that you spend sitting in your automobiles. Fuel consumption is an ongoing challenge for us. Carbon emissions, when we think about the environment, are starting to become alarming issues. In fact, Texas ranks second in the nation in fuel consumed and carbon produced, not the top of list that you want to be at the top of. And as most important to all of us, Dr. Walton's talked about it, uh, the safety of our system is paramount. Here in Texas in 2013, we experienced 3,377 automobile-related crash fatalities. 3,377, the cost of that to society was over $25 billion. I want you to think about that for a minute. $25 billion worth of societal impacts due to 3,377 fatalities and serious injury crashes that were much more numerous than that here in Texas alone in 2013. In 2014, which just wrapped up a few weeks ago, as most of you know, uh, some of you may have missed that if you were studying for your doctoral thesis and that sort of thing, but the New Year's has come and gone. 3,493 fatalities in Texas due to automobile-related crashes. And as I stand before you this morning, since January 1st, just about eight weeks ago now, 379 people have lost their lives in Texas due to an automobile-related crash. If for no other reason, that's why departments of transportation have to be interested in this intelligent transportation system and set of solutions to be able to change the game and get that horrible carnage that's occurring reversed and drive towards zero deaths on our transportation systems. There are also numerous emerging technologies that we feel like we can take uh, advantage of. We think that through properly deploying these solutions, we'll be have, able to have a more efficient system to start addressing some of those congestion and mobility challenges. We'll be able to provide better real-time traveler information to the public so that they can determine where they want to go, what mode of transportation they want to take, and to plan their activities in terms of transportation so that they're able to do that in the most effective and efficient way. Also, we think it will enable a two-way communication so that automobiles, as they travel on our network, can inform us to help us deploy our assets more effectively. Can you imagine if during this last snow and ice event, the automobiles that were traveling on the roadway were connected to infrastructure and they were sending back messages about where temperatures were dropping, where moisture exist existed, and where roadway traction started to be lost so that we could send out snow and ice removal crews to those locations rather than just simply patrolling the system as we currently do uh, in a lot of situations. As Dr. Walton mentioned, sensors are great, but they're not ubiquitous. And if you can imagine every vehicle communicating, we would be able to know real time what was happening on the network. We would understand where potholes can exist, where bottlenecks may occur, and be more able to rapidly respond to those. We also think that uh, these technologies will drive a safer solution. There's been a lot of research done, and what's interesting to note is that 95% of all these crashes that we've been talking about did not have to occur. They occurred because of driver error. Somebody was distracted or perhaps fell asleep at, behind the wheel. Maybe they were operating in a, sa a speed that was unsafe. But by eliminating that driver error, we're going to be able to make significant changes in the way our system operates and the crashes that occur and the effectiveness of it. We also believe that through these technologies, we'll have a better community experience. If you can imagine um, a system where automated vehicles and connected vehicles could 
understand where they could drop off their passengers in a more effective way. Land use planning could change significantly because parking could be consolidated rather than having to have people go all around the network trying to find out where they could park. Um, you could have better movement of people and goods through fewer vehicles by having this connected system. And uh, that would possibly help us address this growing congestion challenge that we're facing. We also think that there would be better environmental uh, friendliness about the system. We would have less fuel consumed. Uh, these technologies will probably quickly accelerate the development of electric vehicles and vehicles operating alternative fuels so that that carbon footprint is reduced dramatically. And perhaps uh, important to people like myself who are starting to age uh, to a point where we start to have to wear glasses and our reaction times are slower, these technologies will open up a world of mobility and freedom to individuals who currently have impairments due to physical disabilities or perhaps visual impacts or their age as, as a, a, a whole that today they don't enjoy. And what a great thing to be involved with as a public sector entity to help bring that about. So as we think about these things, then the question becomes, well, if all of that's possible and that's the reason you're involved in it, how are we going to make this happen? And we know that uh, as we think about these things, it's important to understand that uh, there's a lot of work to be done. And I think that is part of what this center may help us think through. Uh, it's not just about the technology itself, but it's about all of those political issues and societal issues that come into play. For instance, if we create an environment where on the major roadway networks these things work, what happens when they get off of those networks and they're on city streets uh, or perhaps on county roads in very rural areas of the state? Have we created an environment where all of a sudden we have challenges that we didn't expect to occur? What happens about the licensing of people? If an, if an automobile pulls up in front of your school or your home and it picks you up and there's not a driver and you need to automatically take over a manual operation, what is a licensing requirement? And, and how do you license that from an insurance and liability protection perspective? How do you develop uh, reliable solutions that people can trust and depend upon in terms of data security and protection of the operations itself to meet whatever regulations government puts in place around them? And are there changes in law about uh, what an operation of a vehicle really means? Uh, can you just put your kid in a vehicle that nobody else is driving and send them off to school someday like the Jetsons did? Those are the types of things that we have to think about. Vehicle inspections, what does that mean? Do you have to bring them in and have a human being touch them or can you do like the Tesla system where they analyze your vehicle all the time and then just send out you know, over the internet whatever maintenance requirements and upgrades to the system they need to have. And then accident reporting, how would that all happen and who would be responsible for it? And how would you determine if it was a valid report or if it was just something that someone produced? And then, of course, who owns all of that data? And we've talked about that a little bit, uh, but uh, that is a big issue in the private sector space. And I will pull out my phone, I'm, I'm, and I, I'm embarrassed. It's an I-5. I don't have an I-6. But how many of you know that on your, inter your I-5 or I-6 phones, the system knows where you've been? I can pull it up and show you. They know every place you visited, when you connected to the system. They have these dots that are bigger if you've been there more often and smaller if you've not. And when people started finding out about it and the audiences I ran in, and they said, man, I need to clear this. I don't want anybody to know that as an Aggie, I was down at the Longhorn Club with Dr. Walton. But in private sector, that's OK. In the public sector, it's not. People don't want their governmental agencies sharing that kind of information about them with other people. All of that will have to be discussed. How do the state and local governments get involved in helping pay for this and enabling it? A big challenge that all of us must think through. And what happens if security issues related to the transmission and receiving of that data starts to erode? Uh, if somebody is to, able to disrupt the system and all of a sudden all the vehicles lose connection, what happens then? Those are the things that we have to think through. And, and what are we going to do with flow? The automobile insurance industry is going to be out of business. And she won't have a job. In reality, those types of things will happen, whether it's insurance sales people or companies. Uh, perhaps it's automobile repair uh, companies who 
repair damaged automobiles due to crashes. Trauma nurses and doctors and emergency room staff, what if they automatically are eliminated because there are no crashes to occur? Uh, funeral homes, if this mortality rate goes down, how does that change their business? All of these things are important for us to think about, and as a public sector entity, it's important for us to be engaged in this type of conversation with all of you to think through those things because oftentimes they're overlooked and missed and they are realities or potential realities that we have to be seriously concerned about. So at the end of it all, there are the challenges that will be faced. What's the value of this data? What are the issues with, around sharing that data? And how can it be leveraged because it is something that everybody wants, as Dr. Walton said, to help pay for this system. We all know that these services and solutions are not going to be provided at no cost. There will be significant cost to all of them. But can that data that we're talking about be used in a way to develop public-private partnerships where the communications industry, the automobile industry, and the public sector can share and exchange that data to help pay for the development and implementation and operation of these systems. I'm very excited about this opportunity because we already see those kinds of partnerships being formed with com companies like Waze and others where they're taking and harvesting data that public sectors uh, collect through our intelligent transportation systems and traffic management centers, taking that data, manipulating it, and then putting it back out to private sector companies and individuals for a return on that investment, but providing it to public sector agencies like us for free so that we can inform motorists and, and users of our system. There will also be a need for government to think about how we develop policies, regulations, and controls around this. And it's critical that we be cautious about what we do and how far we go. We don't want to discourage innovation and entrepreneurialism, but we want to make sure that there's consistency in use. Uh, it's must be a paradigm shift that as you drive on a system, uh, whether it's from a particular automobile manufacturing industry or communication system, that as it transitions into another area of this country or across the globe, that that communication and effective use is consistent and, and available. Uh, you, it would be horrible to have a T-Mobile phone system that uh, is driving your, your, your vehicle and you move into a space that's not serviced by T-Mobile and it's unable to work. Those types of changes have to be managed and government may have a role to play in that. Uh, partnerships with uh, all types of industry and academia will be incredibly important to us as we move forward. And I think at the end of it all, the most important thing is for us to be thinking about the security of all this information. As we've talked about, um, there is extreme volumes of data and I know much of today is uh, devoted to discussing that but how to understand that data, to manage it, um, to harvest it, to manipulate it, and to use it is important. And, in, and embedded in all of that is a conversation around how to make sure that it's secure, protected, and used for the purposes for which it was intended. Uh, I had a conversation with Dr. Bott, I think it was two weeks ago, and he talked about perhaps some of you in this room who have already identified this vulnerability where we we have people that can masquerade virtually as a vehicle on the network when there's really not one there, and then who could clone and, and then mask a real vehicle so that it's there but nobody knows it is. Those types of security issues have to be addressed because uh, if we can't prevent those, then there will be chaos, and when there's, where there's chaos, there's a loss of control and, and then all, obviously a loss of confidence. So at the end of it all, we, as a public sector inter interest, are involved in this for three primary purposes. One, to ensure that we can get the safest possible system for the people that use what we provide to them, transportation. Secondly, that we get the most out of that transportation system that we can because we all have limited resources and believe it or not, as our population and use of this system grows, we have reached a point where we can't build the, our way out of this any longer. We have to operate it more effectively. And then third is to ensure that we remain relevant as uh, transportation as something we own starts to evolve into something else, whether that's a service provided to us like Uber or it's a shared use environment where communities have vehicles that they share or it's a completely transformational transportation system where 
Scotty can beam us up. We have to be involved in that because that's what we're in the business of doing. And without doing that, we won't be relevant any longer. So thank you for the opportunity to share with you just a high level perspective of why departments of transportation are heavily engaged in this. And to thank you for your involvement in DSTOP and this center as a whole, because we know that through these types of activities, we'll be able to see what that future is that is upon us or soon will be, and to be ready to respond to that in a way that provides for the best of the, for the public, which is ultimately our inspiration and our responsibility. Dr. Bott, thank you. setting the stage opening session uh, so I'd like to invite any of you who uh, have any questions once again not too detailed not too technical at this point uh, but at a level um, that we are talking yeah go ahead so in terms of the liability and insurance for the liability for these kinds of technologies so as fanning the government in the 30s started fanning may led to uh, essentially insuring properties and led to a boom in the property market do you think that the federal or state governments are going to at some point step in and take the liability for, auto for autonomous vehicles, technologies, so that companies can maybe take the risk and put out these kinds of technologies? I'll start. So the question is around the liability associated with these types of technologies. And is government going to step in and provide uh, for that liability, uh, or at least create an environment where it's understood and managed? And I believe that that's probably the traditional path that we're on is product liability attorneys will tell you that they can look at these things and determine what liability uh, might exist and then how to develop a licensing or regulatory environment around that liability. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, some are suggesting that as this continues to evolve, transportation will move from an individual ownership model to a service provided model, much like the airline industry is today or uh, if you will, the, um, the grocery industry is today. So you don't grow your own products, you go and purchase them. And so if it moves to that, that service provided model, then all the liability shifts with the service provider rather than the individual. And uh, that will dramatically change the way that these types of systems are developed and managed. Uh, since we don't know, I think we have to be very careful about how we delve into this because uh, regulations can sometimes uh, and most often do, dampen creativity and innovation rather than in, encourage it. So uh, this is a big issue. Um, I think the, it won't be industry, it won't be academia that solves it. It'll, I think obviously it will be the liability insurance uh, lawyers. And uh, I know that companies like General Motors, Toyota, and Ford are already thinking about, what if we own all the vehicles and we just make them available to your use through a smartphone application what insurance do we need to have to protect ourselves from that product liability risk? Since we're at kind of the mega question, kind of part of the, um, our day, um, as both uh, Dr. Walton and John Barton were talking about technology and all the wonderful changes that we have, it provoked me to think, of, and there was a mention about longer commutes um, why are we coming so far? And you have to understand, uh, my background is urban planning. So I was led to think about equity issues and land use issues that have, that force people to, to have long commutes because of the lack of affordable housing. Um, also, some people are reside, uh, choose to live in places where they have better schooling for their children. And those are issues that are outside the scope of, let's say, us here for this conference, but that really influence a lot of the movements and the choices that people have. Um, and I always think about the, the, the people who clean our bathrooms. I'm sorry, I mean, I, those people, usually the ones that have the longest community, 
and have the fewest choices to move around. Let's not forget them. I think that's an important point, Mike, if you want to respond to that. No, I could agree more. We do see that, again, it comes back to the business models, and we're going to see a lot of changes take place, not only the commute, living space, probably an opportunity for closer integration of land use than we've ever had before. There's more motivation, I think, to do that. But, uh, you know, there's so much changes that are taking place right now as a result of it. And also, we've seen this incredible explosion of return to the urban space, the urban core. So it's a place we took people. Exactly. So it's a two-inch view. I don't, I don't know. I, my glass is always halfway full. So I'm very optimistic about our being able to address those issues a little bit better. Do we want to ask that? We'll, we'll see. We'll see. And, and Lydia, uh, some of the uh, speakers later on are going to be touching upon some of the issues that you raised on the planning side. But really, the, 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 the bottom line is that could be unintended consequences of all of these things. And it's up to us to try to project forward, try to understand what they may be, and perhaps be proactive in trying to reduce the level of those uh, possible consequences. But yeah, a very important point. Good point. Thank you. Thank you for raising that. I, I, I had a general question, uh, <coughs> both John as the um, Deputy Executive Director of TechStart and Mike as the Chair of the TechStart Tech Technology Task Force Company. Um, what I, what are the plans um, regarding testing and implementation of some of these connected vehicles, autonomous vehicles? Um, how do you foresee um, agencies, public agencies, but also the whole partnerships moving forward with this whole notion of trying to test, trying to see how things are? What what do you see the plan to be? Well, I'll start that. Uh you know, I think public sector uh, entities, uh, primarily at the state level at the moment, are starting to explore how to create partnerships to experiment with these technologies, to understand how they might work, and to uh, help encourage the development of them. Uh, here in Texas, we've created a public-private partnership, if you will, called Accelerate Texas, where private companies can come in and have a, an incubator test bed environment to experiment with their technologies, get them market ready, and then uh, go forward with the commercialization of those. And in addition to that, we believe that uh, it's important for us to invest significant resources, probably in the $7 million per year range, in these test bed environments across the state at all of our major universities to uh, focus in on these new technologies, uh, not only in autonomous connected vehicles, but also in innovative materials and, and technologies that are related to transportation. Uh, it's important, I think, to do that uh, because in the absence of that, the private industry will develop their technologies, but the way I view it in my mind is that oftentimes we have solutions that are in search of a problem rather than finding solutions to the problems that we have. And so it's important for these uh, technology and communications and automobile industry companies to be able to engage the public through its governmental entities to understand what, what are those challenges and issues and then to develop solutions that will enable um, the community to address those rather than uh, you know finding ways to use the solutions they've come up with for problems that maybe aren't our most pressing problems or maybe aren't even helpful in the end and so uh, I think that that's the way this uh, needs to work and Many would argue, let the private sector develop things and we'll, we'll take advantage of whatever they develop. And, and in many places and spaces, that's appropriate. But in the transport of people, goods, and services, I think there is a, a very uh, strong argument to be made that there needs to be this public and private sector engagement, involvement, and partnership to get the best out of those resources rather than allowing the tail to wag the dog. I would just echo that. I thought, for example, a uh, state agency like TechStart getting involved in identifying the, recognizing the changes that are taking place and how they could leverage that. So uh, I thought it was very interesting when they set up this technology task force, which was vision.
vision is having thought leaders outside of government agencies necessarily, outside of industry, to find some of the leaders in various sectors and bring them together to talk about emerging technology. It's not necessarily about uh, a particular problem or opportunity, but educating others about what are some of the technological developments that are taking place. That's how you begin to bring in the public sector to understand that there's some opportunities out there of leveraging this technology in a proper way. So this Accelerate Texas came out of this, this the technology task force saying that, okay, the transformational technology that we're facing today is probably the driver of the city. Yeah, you're not going to go from where we are now, jump straight into that. But if you have a perspective of what the future is like, the investments that are made by government agencies and the, the private sector can lead you in that perspective. Will it change over time? Sure, that's the intent. So in essence, you know, we had uh, not only thought leaders from government uh, or from the private sector come in, but also the government sector from different agencies. For example, the regional mobility authorities, uh, the MPOs, who take play an increasingly important role in the, in the future uh, in a collaborative way. But then people from outside the state of Texas and then some international who are dealing with the technological development. So what is taking place right now um, is a series of interviews that are being conducted key people both in government and in the private sector to put together their thoughts about what are these technologies that in their view might make a difference sometime in the future and then developing white papers which address each of those. For example, as you would imagine, a lot of the key stakeholders are focused on technologies like drones. You know, probably six months ago, everyone sort of laughed at drones. I mean, yeah, sure, it will, but not, not anytime soon. And then what happened? They come out with guidelines. The FAA comes out with guidelines about drones. All of a sudden, that's a, that's a game changer. It's real. It's kind of like autonomous vehicles. You talk about it, and I showed you that view in uh, 1950 or whatever, and then Google does something. And all of a sudden, everyone's talking about that thing. So I think there are plenty of interesting opportunities, but it is a collaborative, it is a public private partnership involved in this technology task force for venture capital, social media, I mean, outside of the realm of just technology. <clears throat> so it's really interesting. We had a number of contacts from other state DOTs wanting to know exactly how uh, this happened, and how could they model something like that. It's kind of an interesting opportunity to change. There is the fear that you've got technology Search of a problem. And as researchers, we all know that, and we deal with that a great deal. But when you put the right people together, it's an interesting. Thing. Right. John, I wanted to ask. Uh, I like this emphasis on remaining relevant, and I see though that there is a bit of a tension between remaining relevant and uh, stepping on toes, right? For uh, an emerging uh, industry from the private sector that might say, "Hey." We wish you were a little less relevant in this area. You know? <laughs> uh, so I wanted to ask a concrete question about infrastructure, because I see that as a, as a potential place where the government can either play a large role or could step back and play a smaller role. And the larger the role the government plays, perhaps the easier uh, the early innovations will, will take off. But maybe the long-term privacy issues are worse in that case. So I'm talking about the infrastructure for vehicle to infrastructure communication. Maybe that's just all over LTE. Maybe that's just you know something that uh, that the that's the handset manufacturers and the uh, the um, AT and T's and Verizon's already have in the back. But there are other ways that, uh, or maybe it's an alternative reality where yeah, yeah the government plays a big role there with little stations along the roadway, and especially for location. So I'm I'm in location, I'm in location for cars. Uh, the government can play a very good catalyzing role providing reference data so that we can get these cars located down to a, a 10 centimeters or less. Uh, private sector would also do it. But, you know, it would jumpstart things and the government would, would, would do that. And then it might put the government in a more relevant long-term position. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are 
on that concrete topic of infrastructure. Not agreeing to infrastructure. That, that yeah. is yeah. perfect. So, uh, you, you know, Aggie can understand that. Um, <laughs> it's a, it's a, a very salient topic that's a big part of the discussion we're having nationally. Uh, and um, the, there's this tension between government paying for and, and developing the infrastructure necessary. Um, and if, if that's done, what limitations does it create? And by that I mean uh, the government, the typical government model is you find what you want, you purchase it, and then you sustain it for as long as you possibly can. And so technology will outpace that infrastructure, but it won't be useful because it still has to communicate based on a VHS tape rather than yeah, an MP3 type of device. And so there's this thought, well, then we ought to let the private sector do it so it'll all, always be automatically refreshed uh, to the newest technology. But you have to do that in a way where there's, I think, ubiquitous, ubiquitous coverage. And so to me, this conversation is not too dissimilar to the conversation around power when it was first electric power. Uh, you know, it was private sector driven, and large communities have it, but if you lived out in the country, you still had kerosene lamps and that sort of thing. And all of a sudden, government had to say, we're going to make electricity available to everyone. Uh, if this type of technology is going to be rapidly deployed, is there a place in the space for government to say, we're going to enable that? And whether it's through uh, actually harvest or putting it in place or just managing how it's put in place and helping fund it is the question. Um, a, an example that I'm grappling with now with the legislature is um, on another technology, and that is the conversion of heavy vehicles from diesel engines to liquefied natural gas engines. And when you look at the benefits of doing that, they're clearly there. But the cost of developing the, the fueling stations to provide for that and converting the fleet are significant. And if you're the private sector and it's left up to you alone, you'll never make that decision to just keep burning diesel. And so, is it worth the public to say, to the public, say government will pay for that, but it'll all be privately developed? And, and those are the questions we're having. I think that uh, in terms of relevancy, what government needs to do is understand what role it needs to and should play. And if that means you evolve away from being the primary provider of something to uh, a group that enables it, and perhaps ensures that it's ubiquitous, uh, then that's that's a paradigm shift we have to make, but it is something we have to do. And so I, I don't know the answer to the question, but as we talk about it, from my point of view, uh, what I'm encouraging is that we, we look at the, the societal benefits of investing in that technology and that infrastructure to support it, uh, but be mindful of the fact that it's evolving so quickly the traditional government approach of buying, you know, the latest version of Microsoft Office and then keeping it in place for 15 years won't work. And there's going to have to be some kind of public-private partnership where we um, financially enable the private sector to put it in place, uh, make sure that it communicates everywhere so that you don't have a T-Mobile phone and an AT&T coverage area that doesn't work, uh, but also stay out of the uh, operations, maintenance, and asset management of that, and let the public sector or private sector do it because they'll be evolving that technology so quickly. That's a that's a big conversation. It's easy to talk about in three minutes, but it's a huge and complicated issue to, to solve.